Hi, in this tutorial we'll take a look at the pattern generator nodes. The pattern generator nodes are the heart of the new pattern engine and they allow you a lot of flexibility in creating patterns and textures. All pattern engine nodes are obviously available both for the layer stack as well as the node graph. However, in this video tutorial we'll cover the node in a node graph context. You can create the node under the procedurals group, extension pack, generators, and in here we have a lot of nodes that are part of the pattern engine. In this tutorial we'll focus on the pattern generators, so the pattern generator 2dx1, 2dx4, and the triplanar versions. The pattern generator nodes are sort of the uber nodes or swiss army knife nodes of the pattern engine. They encompass all settings, while other pattern engine nodes are merely derivatives of this node. So those are tailored more towards specific tasks such as splattering textures or creating symmetrical textures. The pattern generated node can do all of these tasks as well, however that obviously makes it more expensive. The good thing is, by learning this node you will automatically also learn the other pattern engine nodes. Let's dive right in and view the result of the pattern generator node when I first created, and you can see I get this fairly simple pattern consisting of a few squares. Here we have a lot of the different groups, and the first thing is the random seed. In this case, changing the random seed would not do anything because each pattern is completely identical, so changing the seed would not do anything, so we'll take a look at this feature a little bit later. Under the amount group, you can specify the number of cells this node will create. It is important to understand that the pattern generator node family does not create tileable textures, which is different, for example, from something that Substance Designer would do. Instead, the node creates completely unique cells at each point of your model. By changing the amounts, you can specify the number of cells you want to create. So for example, I could do a unique amount in X and a unique amount in Y, or I can use the amount multiplier. Under the pattern group, you can define which shape to fill each cell of the node with. You'll find these options similar to what is available in the shape nodes, which are dedicated nodes just to create shapes. So the options here are almost one-to-one -one identical. I can, for example, create a frame, and then use the pattern-specific 1 and 2 options to modify this frame. The pattern-specific options only apply to certain elements here, so for example if I create a square, changing pattern-specific 1 or 2 will not have any effect. However, for example, if I go to the crescent, I have an effect again. The pattern size is the first size slider you'll find in this node. I specifically point this out because there are multiple size sliders available inside of the node that all kind of interact with each other. So be aware that each pattern has its unique size element that can be set separately. So for example, we could make this fill out more of the available cell by changing this to 1, or you can even put in your cursor and use the arrow up keys to increase the size. Now you can see the size here is limited to the size of the actual cell. So when I reach the cell limit, or the cell boundaries, the pattern will be cut off, which can actually help in some cases to create unique patterns or unique textures. Let's step this back to a value of 1. We also have a pattern rotation, which sets a unique starting rotation for the pattern. Finally, we have the pattern alpha intensity. At 1, the pattern gets generated with a completely white alpha, so everything is solid. However, if I lower this, I'm starting to pre-multiply the shape with itself in the alpha. So this way you have a very soft effect on the shape itself. If I, for example, go to a Gaussian shape, pre-multiplying the shape with itself would dramatically change the look of the pattern. These first few sliders I talked about only affect procedurally generated shapes. So under the pattern groups, I have all these procedurally generated shapes, but at the very top, I can switch to an input image, which might be out of frame in this case, but at the very top, basically, you can find the input image. By using the input image, I can give it any texture that I want to use inside of the node. So I'm gonna go to my grunge shelf that comes with my extension pack and load in a texture just by clicking on it and just drag it in here. And now I use an input image instead of the supplied procedural shapes. If I adjust the pattern repeat, I can change the repeat of this texture that I'm using. Obviously, this would also work if I were to use a procedural shape. By changing the pattern random X and Y, I'll randomly offset the tileable texture. 
The Pattern Random X and Pattern Random Y sliders are the first of many options inside of the pattern generators to start to break the repetitiveness of the node. So just by changing this, we already introduce a slight modification per cell, which makes it no longer 100% looking identical across cells. If I choose Invert Pattern, I can simply invert the result of the pattern. So in this case, I'm simply inverting the supplied image. If I were to use a bell shape, I would instead invert the procedural shape. The blend mode is the blend mode used to blend in between cells. Because at the moment these cells do not have any overlap, I will not get any effect from changing this. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and go to the size group. Let's increase the size of each cell. So we have an overlap in between cells. Now changing the blend mode will show you its effect because in the overlapping areas, the screen mode will be in effect. Next, we have a variety of edge controls. The edge controls allow you to create sort of a brush effect on your textures. I'm gonna increase this slightly and you get a very soft blending. Let me reset the scale to make this more obvious. So at zero, we have the texture as we supplied it. And by changing the edge fall off, I'm gonna slightly make it softer. The edge softness further controls the softness. And the edge roundness determines if we're using a square or a round softness. The edge distortion slider applies a warping effect to the edges of your pattern. So if I increase the size here for a second, you can see I still have sort of an overlap, even though things start to blend quite nicely already by using the edge softness. If I apply the edge distortion, either in minus one or plus one, I'm dramatically already improving the look and the blending of this. The edge distortion works by using the luminance of the image multiplied with the softness. At edge distortion one, I'm hiding black pixels in the area where a softness transition happens. And by using a edge distortion of minus one, I'm hiding white pixels where edge softness is in effect. If I scale the pattern down again, and apply an edge distortion of one, you can see how the edges start to be kind of uneven. Changing the edge softness, I will further change this effect because the edge distortion is multiplied by the edge softness. With all these settings that we already learned, we can already start to have a quite a random pattern. So just by changing the random X and applying an edge distortion, I have something of a unique texture that is sort of splattered around. Since we already have the first random effects going on, I can now go back to my random seed and start changing it. And I would get a completely unique cell generated for each point of your model just by changing the random seed. The edge controls of your pattern can also be mapped via the node graph. So you can see on the node, I have the edge falloff, softness and roundness exposed. Let me create a Cloud or FBM node. I'm gonna create a set range node to remap the values and plug this into the edge softness, for example. By changing the Cloud node, I have the effect of the Cloud node now multiplied against the slider of the edge softness. Change the remap a little bit, I can tweak this further to my liking. Let's plug the set range into the edge roundness to modify or iterate between a round shape and a square shape. Now you notice nothing happens at the moment. It is important to remember that these sliders here are still multiplied against the ports. So having an edge roundness of zero effectively deactivates the edge roundness port as well. If I put this in at one, this port is fully evaluated, and if I go back to my set range node, and for example, set this to zero, now I'm using the cloud node to switch between a round and a square shape, which further enhances the look or gives more of a brush effect on your shapes. Let's play around with this so you get more of an idea. So as you can see, I can create very unique patterns this way already. I scale this up again. I have even more of a random effect on my entire texture. Below the edge controls, you'll find some rotation settings. These rotation settings define the start rotation of the pattern. By default, it is at zero degrees. 
We can switch it to 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. This rotation is different than the pattern rotate. The pattern rotate only applies to the procedural shapes, while the rotation down here applies to any pattern including an input image. We also have the ability to apply a random 90 degree rotation. Changing this random rotation slider applies the random rotation in 90 degree increments. Let's see how we can use this to our advantage by switching to a different pattern. We can use the wave, we can reset this pattern fully to default, and then I'll start playing with the pattern specific options. I have something like this. I'm gonna use the pattern alpha intensity to bring down the alpha a little bit. And then start increasing the random rotation. As you can see, I can quite easily this way create a nice grid pattern, usable for example for fabric patterns. Let's move on to the pattern crop section. The pattern crop section, similar to what happens in the shape nodes, allows you to crop your used pattern per cell. So if I move down the top, I'm cropping the rendered region from the top down. The pattern crop is applied before the rotation. So if I apply, for example, a random rotation, you can see the crop is not following always just from the top, but it is being rotated by the random rotation. Let's switch to a different shape. Reset the random rotation to zero and just use the rotate of the crop. The crop always goes along the entire cell. So if I rotate by 45 degrees, I automatically get sort of a traffic sign shape. I could play with the pattern size to reduce the size further to have a triangle shape. You can change the crop to actually go above one in this case. So if I step it up, I'm using the edge of my cell to work with a different shape. Let's reset this to one again and switch back to the input image because we're moving on to the input image group. As shown a few minutes ago, the input image group is only evaluated if the pattern is set to input image. Apart from supplying the image, you can also define how the alpha of the image is used. By default, I'm using a from map alpha. So if there's an alpha channel embedded into your image, the image will use the alpha channel to pre-multiply inside of the pattern generator. If I set this to white, even if there's a transparency embedded in your image, the alpha will be set to fully white. Alpha as luminance will use the luminance of the image to create an alpha for you, and alpha as inverse luminance will create the inverse result. This is similar when you use the paint through tool and under the stencil options, you use the luminance or inverted luminance. Moving on, we will head to the size group. The size group controls everything about the size of the features or the size of the cells. So we have the main scale that I've covered earlier. Let's go back to the pattern and change the blending mode to something like, for example, screen. I'm gonna apply a slight edge fall off just to make it a little bit nicer to look at. Let's head back to the size group. So scale affects the main scale of the cells. We can separately adjust the size in X and Y of each cell. And we can also apply a separate randomization effect for X and Y. So now you can see I have differently shaped or differently sized cells. If I set this to minus, I'm going to stretch the cells in either X or Y. The random scale uniformly scales down each cell based on a random value. This is different from the random size X and Y, which applies a randomization effect only in one axis, while the random scale applies it in both axes. Down here we have some different multipliers. So we have a scale map multiplier, a scale map random, and a normal map multiplier. This affects anything that is mapped on the ports of the pattern generator nodes. So for example, we have the scale map here, we have a normal map here, and these are the sliders that affect these ports. Let's start with a scale map. I'm going to create a cloud node again, just because I like my cloud nodes. 
and hook this up to the scale map. Now if I increase the scale map multiplier, the cloud node is used to sample the scale of each cell. So I'm randomizing the shape of each cell a little bit this way. Now you might be familiar with Substance Designer. Substance Designer does something quite similar, however, it is also a little bit different. Substance Designer usually samples per cell. So in Substance Designer's case, for example, the cloud node would be averaged per cell and the value would be uniform per cell as well. Here in Mari, the cloud node is sampled per pixel. So basically, I'm changing the size per pixel instead of per cell. This is either way a limitation, but can also be an advantage, depending how you look at it. So it's just a little bit different from what you might be used, for example, in Substance Design. If I change the scale map random, I will randomize the result of this cloud even further. So instead of using straight up what the cloud node gives me, value-wise, I will add a random value to what's coming from the cloud node. scales up further and you can see we get quite interesting effects already let me play with the cloud node to show you its effect let's add a random rotation for example and again we have a very interesting pattern straight out of the box The scale map effects dropdown determines what the scale map actually drives. So we have by default the x and y axis, but I can also just limit it to change just the x axis. So now each shell is only scaled along its x axis. Changes the y and change the multiplier again. Each cell is changed in its y direction. For the normal map multiplier to work, we need to have a normal map attached to the pattern generator. So let's step into the node graph and create a height as normal node, which converts a height map to a normal map. Let's attach this to the normal map slot of the pattern generators. Step into the node, into the node properties, and increase the bump weight quite a lot, so we can see it more clearly in the video. And now, inside of the pattern generator, I will increase the normal map multiplier. As you can see, now the norm map is used to do a per pixel scale change per cell. As with the scale map, using the scale map effects, you can limit this effect to either X or Y. You can also invert the effect by changing the norm map multiplier to a negative value. For now, let's turn off the effects of the normal map scale map on the scaling and let's move on to the position group. The position group randomly offsets each cell. So if I apply a random offset in X and Y, my cells randomly shift around, giving a lot more randomness to the pattern. You can also apply a global offset to the entire pattern. And we can also use a displacement map to offset the position of each cell. I'm going to use this existing cloud map and plug it into the displacement map. If I now change the displacement intensity, I can warp my cells. Now the first thing you notice here, and something that's very important, is these seams that are appearing. These seams are a limitation of the computation, and it is a setting that can be changed. So if I'll go to the layering here, I have a layer cutoff. This is the most important setting in this entire node when it comes to performance. So if you notice seams, you will have to increase the layer cutoff. If I change this, you can see these seams go away, but the node will also become slower. If you increase the layer cutoff too much, the node will become quite slow after a while. So it is always recommended to keep the setting as low as possible without seams. But if you have seams, obviously, you'll have to increase it. So again, using the displacement, I can easily warp the effects of my entire pattern using an input in the node graph. So here I have a cloud node and I warp the entire result using this cloud map.
As with the size, I can also use my normal map to warp the effect. So let's reset the displacement intensity and change the normal map displacement. While the displacement intensity has a fixed direction that is determined by the displacement angle, the normal map displacement can randomly rotate its displacement direction based on the normal direction. So if I increase this value slightly, and if I were to change the direction of the normal map by, for example, converting its orientation between a direct X normal map to an OpenGL normal map, so I'll do this using a extension pack node, which is called OpenGL to DirectX. So if I flip this in here and hook this up to the normal map slot, the direction of my displacement will change. Mari by default uses DirectX normal maps. So its shaders, as well as the height to normal, expect or create a DirectX normal map. Using this extension pack node, you can convert between a DirectX and an OpenGL normal map. In this case, because I'm already getting a DirectX normal map from the height as normal node, I will convert between a DirectX to a OpenGL normal map, which changes the orientation, which is why the direction of the displacement will change. So let's be a bit subtle about this effect. And you can see what's happening. I'm slightly warping the effect. Let's actually use the keyboard to control this. To slightly offset this pattern. Obviously, I can also still use the displacement map to apply a secondary effect. Before we move on to the rotation group, let's back up a little bit and check what is going on with these offset and offset type attributes. For this purpose, I'm going to simplify this node visually a little bit and just use some simple squares and let me reset all these settings to their defaults. change all the offsets and displacements, and reset the size so I have a uniform effect. So there seems to be a displacement going on. All right. So the offset changes the offset for every second item. So here, if I change the offset and I have this set to horizontal Linux, I will change every other row. So this way, you can have a nice staggered effect. If I set this to vertical, it'll do this effect for each row, or for each column, sorry. Next, let's check the horizontal global and vertical global. Horizontal global will change, or will add the offset value incrementally to each row. Now, one thing to note is, if I change the amount here, you'll see that the effect cuts off at a certain point. This is, again, the result of the layering cutoff. So if I change the layer cutoff and increase that, you'll see the effect goes more and more visible again. Again, this is a limitation of the computa computation and changing this layer cutoff will make the node a lot more expensive. As you can already see, my mouse is a lot slower now. In order to not always have to deal with the full horizontal global and vertical global, which just adds the offset amount to each row, I can also use the horizontal global normalized and vertical global normalized. So basically this allows for low layer cutoffs while still having a similar effect. Let me do, for example, some slight modifications to make this into a nice pattern. So I'm gonna go to the pattern crop. I'm gonna change the repeat. Where am I? Let me drop down the size a little bit to have the repeat visible. Say let's set this to three. Let's get rid of the random offsets. I'm also gonna hide the pattern rotation. Scale this up a little bit. Maybe let's change the shape to something like a round corner square. Change the repeat to four. And I'm gonna use the size to size this up a little bit. And using the horizontal offset, I can make this into a nice little effect. So let's set this to 0 0.5. And maybe apply a random rotation. 
So I have this sort of weave effect. Again, if I change this to horizontal global, I would have a slightly different effect. Let's check the results of the rotation group next. Let's hide this random rotation for now, so we're not confused with the random rotation from the pattern and only see the rotation effects from the rotation group. I'll close some of the nodes as well and let me reopen the pattern generator nodes. And here we are in the rotation group. So the first rotation is a global rotation per cell. So each cell gets the same rotation applied. Again, if you remember, under the pattern group, there was also a pattern rotate. This kind of works together a little bit. The pattern rotate is applied at a different stage of the computation. So you can see, if I rotate the pattern as well, the shape of the pattern actually changes. Well, if I rotate this, the initial shape of the pattern stays the same and the pattern is only rotated. But if two rotations work together, I get a slightly different effect. Again, the pattern rotate only applies to actually the procedurally generated shapes. So an input image changing the pattern rotation would not have any effect here. Let's reset the pattern rotate to a standard value and only play around with these rotation settings. If I change the global rotation, the entire image will be rotated. The rotation pivot centered determines where the actual rotation pivot is. So on a UDIM 1001, if the rotation pivot, pivot centered is off, I will rotate around the lower corner of the UDIM. If the rotation pivot is centered, I rotate around the center of the UDIM. Next, we have the alternate rotation. The alternate rotation is a secondary rotation applied to each row or column, depending on what row or column is specified under the alternate rotation dropdown. So if I do a 90 degree rotation and specify every second row, every second row will get another rotation. Every second column will give me every second column. And remember, I still have this offset up here. So if I set this to zero, I would have this effect, and with a horizontal quincux offset, I have this effect, which is again a very nice weaving effect. Setting this to every second row and column gives me this effect. The rotation random applies a free rotation to each cell. This is different from the random rotation found under the pattern group, which only works in 90 degree increments. Using the rotation random, you can freely rotate these cells using the maximum rotation steps set under the rotation step slider. If I limit this rotation steps to let's say two, I only have two different rotations. So in this case, instead of having the full 360 degree range of motion, I only have two ranges of motion. So let's say I would have a random value of 45 degrees and another value of 15 degrees then these two values of 45 and 15 degrees would be distributed randomly among cells. The more rotation steps I add, the more unique rotations I get. And obviously, if I set this to 360 degrees, I'm allowing the full range of 360 degrees. The rotation map multiplier and normal map multiplier work similarly to the other settings we had driven by port nodes. Let me use the cloud node and hook this up to the rotation map and increase the rotation map multiplier. Now I'm using the cloud node to randomly rotate parts of the patterns. Similarly, if I change the normal map multiplier, I will rotate using the normal map, which is a unique way of rotating. In this case, it's a bit artifacty, but you'll have to find a norm map that works for this. So let me try and get a better result with this. I will create a um, radial gradient. Actually, I will use a circular gradient and use this in my normal map. Let me view the result. Let's see how this looks. 
So we have a rotation going on here. And let's view how this looks in our pattern generator. And let's just reset the random rotation to zero and apply the normal map multiplier. And you can see I'm rotating my pattern based on the supplied gradient. So here I'm using this with a norm map to rotate each cell in a circular fashion. Again, I can use a random rotation to offset this, which gives very interesting results. Let's make this a bit nicer. Set this, for example, to a different pattern alpha and change the size further. And here we have a different kind of weave effect that is circular. Let's reset all these settings to their defaults so we can move on to the symmetry group. The symmetry group allows you to create symmetrical patterns. To show you this, I'll switch the pattern to a gradation. And now if I apply a random symmetry, you can see the effects of this. You can limit the random symmetry to either the x or y axis. The y-axis will not have any effect in this case because the pattern is already symmetrical within the y-axis. If instead of a gradation I use an input image, let's switch the pattern to input image. Now you'll see the effect more clearly if I just limit this to x or y. In addition to the random symmetry, I can also apply alternating symmetry. I could change every second row, every second column, every second row and column, or I can create a mirrored effect. The mirrored effect will sample in clusters of four cells each to create a mirrored effect in between the pattern. Let's explore next the settings found under the probability masking group. I've gone ahead and created a simple pattern just using a procedural cross. If I change the mask random setting, I will hide parts of the cells. The noise used to generate the mask can be set under the noise type. So for example, I could use a value noise, a ridged noise, or a turbulence noise, which gives different effects. So the turbulence noise is a lot more sparse than, for example, a value noise. The ridged noise is quite aggressive and hides a lot more cells. You can also use the probability map threshold to further threshold the effect of these noises. There's a random seed available to randomize the effect of the noise. The seed in this case acts more like a scaling effect, so you scale up the noise, which makes it sparser in this case. Apart from the mask random, we also have an alternate masking. So I could mask every second row, every second column, or every second row and column. This still works together with the mask random as well. You can also attach a map to hide parts of the maps. So if I go to my node graph and use my trusted cloud node and attach it to the probability map and change the probability map threshold, I'll hide parts of the cells. Again, this is different from, for example, Substance Designer, which in this case would probably hide the entire cell. While this one works per pixel, it acts more like a masking effect where it hides the parts of the cell. You can also invert this map to get a different result. All nodes of the Pattern Engine have a very important setting to be aware of. It's found under the Layering Group and it's called the Layer Cutoff. The layer cutoff is a performance optimization for the node. If it is set to low, you will find you'll have seams happening inside of your pattern under certain conditions. If it is set to high, your FPS count will drop dramatically. So it is important to always optimize this setting. I find it best once you have a pattern that works for you to drop this value down and see when seams are appearing and find a value where the seams disappear. To better understand this setting, let's take a look at an illustration. 
the pattern engine by default works off grid cells, so you create a unique grid cell on each point of your model. The boundaries of these grid cells are fixed, so you cannot change them. If I have content sitting within each grid cell and not overlapping into a neighboring cell, a layer cutoff of one works well. If I take one of these cells and start to move them into neighboring cells, so they overlap into neighboring cells, a layer cutoff of one would no longer be enough, and the result would be that you cut off some parts of the cell. So in this case, you would have to raise the layer cutoff to two to account for the cell shifting into the neighboring cells. If I move it even further, so more than one cell, I would have to raise the layer cutoff to three. So in this case, we need to evaluate three different cells. So the first one, second one, and the third one. So a layer cutoff of three is required. The same applies when you scale content. So a scaled content with a layer cutoff of one will recut the cell contents to the original boundaries of the cell. So I'll need to raise the layer cutoff to two to also evaluate at least one neighboring cell. Back to our pattern generator, let's check out the remaining attributes. Also under the layering group, you'll find an attenuation slider. Using the attenuation, you'll subtract a value from each iteration of the node. So basically, when I increase this, you'll see I'm getting a value subtracted. Usually this should be left at zero, but for some cases, it can be useful to add additional variation. Let's move on to the color group. Under the color group, you can affect the background color of the generated pattern. So with fill background turned off, the result will just be placed against the transparent background, and with fill background turned on, the background color is used. Using the tint, you can multiply a color or value against the final result. The tint interacts with the parameterization multiplier. Raising the parameterization multiplier will create a mix between the tint and the parameterization source. We will touch on the parameterization source in a second. Using the value offset, you can simply subtract or add a value to the final computation. The opacity map or the opacity slider is a global slider to raise or lower the opacity. You can also attach a opacity map to the opacity port in the node graph. If done this, raising the opacity map intensity will show the effect of the opacity map. Using the parameterization source, you can colorize the result of the cells. I have a tiled map attached to the color port of the pattern generator, and if I raise the parameterization multiplier, I'm just overlaying the result of this tiled node over the complete result. You can also switch this to use, for example, the scale as a source. If I'm heading to the size group and add a random scale, you'll see that some of the cells are decreasing in value. I can further contrast this by changing the parameterization contrast. You'll see I'm getting a unique value per cell based on its scale. We reset the random scale and switch the parameterization source to row index. Let's zoom out and you'll see that for each row, I'm getting a unique value. So I'm starting at zero and going all the way to one. Each row will have a unique value. The same is true for the column index. In this case, I'm starting at 1 and going all the way to 0. Each column has a separate value. These values can also be contrasted using the parameterization contrast. Next, we have the pattern index. The pattern index is a unique value per cell. So we're starting at number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. The entire value is normalized to 0 to 1. Next, we have the pattern center position. The pattern center position is similar to the pattern index, however, it gives a unique UV value per cell. Finally, we have the pattern UVs. The pattern UVs gives the original UVs for each cell, so usually this is a 0 to 1 value. Let's have a quick look what we can do with this. I could, for example, change this slightly, and I will use the output of my pattern generator as UVs on a tiled node. So I'll just output this and hook this straight into the UVs of the tiled node. And now if I apply this as an image and view this, I have unique UVs for each um, cell. 
we can further adjust this to kind of get rid of these slight bending effects here, but you can see what you can use this for. So you can map each cell separately using an image. The parameterization effects dropdown defines how the colorization is done. So I can use it in the RGB channels, I can place it in the RGB and alpha channel, or in the alpha only. Finally, let's take a look at the color randomization. I'm gonna turn off the effect of the parameterization. Let me scale on these cells a little bit further and have a look under the randomization. The randomization allows you to randomize different effects such as the U, the saturation, the luminance, and the opacity. If you made it this far in the tutorial, you'll probably realize that this node is quite powerful in creating all these sorts of different patterns. Before we conclude this tutorial, I want to look at another pattern generator node. I'll go to the nodes, procedurals, extension pack, generators, and have a look at the pattern generator X4. So the pattern generator here, the X1, has one input, either the input image, or a procedural pattern, such as, for example, a round corner, bell shape, square, etc. If I look at the pattern generator X4, this node is slightly different. It does not have any procedural patterns, however, it has up to four different input images that you can use. Let's use an example of this node to see some of the slight differences towards the pattern generated X1 node. First, I'll supply some input images. So I'll use some different grunges inside of the input images. And first things first, I need to go to the amount group and change the number of inputs I'm using. So I can switch this to use just one input, two inputs, three inputs, or if I use four inputs, because I have not mapped the fourth input, I will have holes in my pattern. Under the pattern group, you have the usual attributes that you also have under the X1 attributes, apart from the ones that only were valid for the procedural shapes. So here I could, for example, adjust the pattern repeat and apply a random offset. Let's set this back to one and have a look under the input images. The organization of the node is a little bit different because each attribute or each input image has its own blend mode, its own opacity, and its own edge fall off sliders. So here, for example, I could use the alpha as luminance, and I'll also use this on the other input images. I will apply an edge distortion. For this to work, I first need to change the edge fall off a little bit. So let's use the luminance to have a bit of a blend effect going on here. I want to hide the white pixels in this case. I will change the blend mode for each image, I think to screen in this case. And let's go to the size group and increase the size. Probably have to do a better job of blending this together just by changing the edge fall off a little bit. And maybe invert this. Add a random scale. And finally, maybe a random position. Add a random rotation. And we can also adjust the opacity separately for each input image. However, we still have the global opacity down here as well. So I can lower this completely. So 
So we have a quite unique crunch map already. Let's get the opacity map to zero, uh, to one, I'm sorry. Let's lower the effect of this white a little bit to make it less jarring. And here we go. So we now used three different images to create a unique crunch map. So you can see how this map or this pattern generator type can be used to combine multiple different images into one effect. The last thing to talk about is the Traplana versions of these nodes. All nodes of the pattern engine have Traplana versions available. So if I try to create a pattern generator, I also have the Traplana versions available here. These nodes have a lot more ports available because they have the same ports as the normal pattern generators, so as the 2D versions, but they also have Traplana specific ports. If I create an access projection node, you'll see I have some of the same ports available on these nodes as well. For example, UV angle, UV offset, and the different axis rotations. One thing that is absent is the world scale. That is because the Traplana versions of the pattern generator nodes, or any of the pattern engine nodes, do not rely on the world scale to generate content, but on the amount specified. In order to change the Traplana scale, you'll have to change the amount multiplier. If you change the UV scaling inside the UV settings, you will actually break the connection, so you might introduce some seams. So if you want a seamless version of this across your entire model, it is better to change the amount multiplier. Apart from the slight change in behavior when you change the UV settings, all these settings under the Transform tab, so the Traplana settings and the UV settings, react the same as in other Traplana nodes. So for example, as in the Axis projection. So if you're familiar with these nodes, you'll be familiar with this part of the pattern generator nodes. This concludes our tutorial on the pattern generator, which is, as I stated before, the most important node of the pattern engine. If you understand all the attributes that I've been talking about and how they react, you'll automatically know how to use all the other nodes of the pattern engine because they share the same attributes. We'll take a quick look in the next tutorial at some of the other nodes, such as the symmetry pattern generator and the splatter nodes. However, these tutorials will be a lot shorter and we'll just quickly browse through some of the effects you can achieve with these nodes and how they're tailored more to specific tasks to make them faster, for example, when you create a splatter effect or a symmetry effect.